Amen, amen. Good morning. I am Pastor Joe Sheeran, privileged and delighted to be uh, welcoming all of you here to worship at Woodland Park Presbyterian Church. There's the microphone. <laughs> if this is your first time here, uh, or first time in a long time, we're glad you're here. We hope that you feel comfortable and invited to participate in as much or as little as feels right to you. Uh, along those lines, we will be celebrating communion later today, as we do every Sunday here at Woodland Park Presbyterian Church. If you are one of those who are joining us at home, it's great to see your, your names and faces on the screen here. Uh, this is your invitation and reminder to have something ready to eat and drink for that part of the service, something that feels right to you. Before we continue in our time of worship, I want to share an announcement that's important to this community. That's our land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that Woodland Park Presbyterian Church and many of our homes are located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Duwamish people and other Coast Salish peoples. We acknowledge they are still here, continuing to honor and bring light to their heritage, and we benefit every day from the theft of their land. And with that acknowledgement and hopes that it would spur us to discernment and action and relationship, Let's continue in worship. One of our traditions born out of this time of pandemic that we are slowly meandering through, or what I hope is the end of, is using ASL for peace be with you as part of our, our exchanging signs of peace. Uh, so whether, if you're really motivated to give a hug or a handshake, a high five, fist bump, uh, some of us like flashing peace signs, but you can also use, that's fine, but you can also use the ASL for Peace Be With You, which I would demonstrate if I had grabbed the right microphone. But Jay Kyle is doing it for you there. Uh, it's Peace of Christ Be With You. Uh, friends, however we're exchanging these signs, however we're meeting each other, let's meet each other as part of this, this body of Christ, part of this community of faith gathered here. Peace of Christ be with you all. Hey, peace of Christ to be with you, Alan. And with you, Peggy. Salwa. Peace of Christ be with you, Salwa. Betty. Peace of Christ be with and you, Nancy. Nancy. And Betty. Roger. Roger. And the monitor. And everyone out there. <laughs> yes. And, and everyone out there. Neola, who I saw was there, managed to give a right. Peace of Christ be with you, Lord. Thank you, my deacon. Oh, thank you. So. Good to see you, you Nancy. Morning, Nancy. Good to see Nancy. Yeah, they're back there, Roger. He's surprised he was your home. Good to see you, Roger. <laughs> That's a good idea. Okay, please join me in the call to worship. People will come from east and west, north and south, and will eat in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. 
We serve a God who hears the cries of those who hunger. We worship a God who comes from heaven to save. Come as one people, let us worship together. Friends, hear the good news. For God, who created this world with the word, that's why I thought you were. Okay. Um, join me in the prayer of confession. This song of love, where the circle grows ever wider. Each time you have revealed yourself to us, your grace and love reaches out further and further, redeeming us from suffering and calling us to be creators of justice, to join in a song of unity and joy, to dance in your delight. Forgive us, Holy One, when we step too cautiously, when we fail to follow in your way allowing injustice to take root, and dancing to the tune of doctrines that are contrary to the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Dance with us anew, Holy One. Correct our steps to match your song of love, and call our hearts back to you. Friends, hear the good news. The God who created this world with a word is not finished speaking. The Christ who lived among us to redeem the world is still alive. And the spirit who moved among and in the people of God is still moving. So where does that leave us? 
Who are we? We are God's beloved and claimed in love. We begin again. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Redeeming God, as we gather to remember your saving purposes for all who are oppressed, give us minds, hearts, and wills to hear your word for us, and then to live it. Amen. The first reading today is from Acts 5, 29 through 32. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed, by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And from 1 Peter 3, 15 through 18. But in your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Maintain a good conscience so that when you are when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. The word of God from the, for the people of God. Will you pray with me? Holy One, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, the actions and lives that we lead in this space and as we depart from here, may they honor you. May they proclaim you in word, indeed and in presence. May you be reflected in our lives and glorified in our beings. Amen. Today we conclude our summer long series looking deeper into our two confessions that have their specific origins in resistance to fascism and white Christian nationalism. Now I have been particularly inspired by our time with the Confession of Belhar, and I hope that you have also. Today, as we read the final two sections together, we end on notes that may be challenging for us today. Therefore, we reject any ideology which would legitimate forms of injustice and any doctrine which is unwilling to resist such an ideology in the name of the gospel. Citing Acts 5, 29 through 32, and 1 Peter 3, 15 through 18, what we had just heard, they go on to say, we believe that in obedience to Jesus Christ, its only head, 
The church is called to confess and do all these things. That is the content of the confession. Even though the authorities and human laws might forbid them and punishment and suffering be the consequence. They conclude, Jesus is Lord to the one and only God, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever and ever. In contrast with the last several weeks, in particular, in contrast with the body of the confession, which have offered flowing words about God's action in and for the world, actions of grace, redemption, and transformation, which demand a reconciliation, not merely of compromise, but of justice. We are reminded today that this transformation demands something of us. The key words in that ninth and final conclusion, that ninth article and final conclusion to Belhar, and the key words in our Bible passages today, since I know some of us like keywords, are suffering, God's will, and obedience. Suffering, God's will, and obedience. Oof. I'm reminded as I read these passages, I think about the impact of this suffering, God's will and obedience, and what is stirring, I imagine, in your hearts as it's stirred in mine, is a recollection of the words of that great American black lesbian feminist socialist mother warrior poet, Audre Lorde, who warned us that the master's tools cannot destroy the master's house. Now the context of those words are In 1984, Lord was already an established poet and prominent black lesbian feminist and invited to speak as part of a panel at the New York University Institute for Humanities conference. The focus of this conference was feminism, but Lord observes that even in this conference, even in this context, she belongs to a a marginalized group. Her audience is white, politically liberal, academic feminists. But Lord looks around the room and sees the force of racist and patriarchal power structures still controlling the narrative. In her essay, she calls out the fact that only two black feminists were invited to speak at this conference and that her own experience of being contacted felt very uh, last minute. The point of her essay is that we cannot hope to solve the problems of oppression, working within the tools and frameworks, the paradigms of systems of oppression. In her context, academics cannot hope to rely on the tools of academia to combat racism, sexism, we might today add queer phobia and other kinds of isms when they're using the tools founded by those systems of oppression. The master's tools cannot destroy the master's house. And so we encounter this directive to embrace suffering, to seek God's will and to live in obedience. And we wonder if these aren't in fact those very tools come back through scripture. If those tools, if if these passages do not in fact reveal the heart of Christianity to in fact be domination and patriarchy. Small wonder that here in Seattle and small wonder that here in this year of our Lord 2024, where we have a secular and pluralistic society, the way that Christianity is often lifted up in our culture, in our narratives, is those who fully participate and embrace that dominating patriarchal capricious God who fully present a God who demands and controls. The polite thing to do in such a context, such a narrative is to keep your Christian faith to yourself. 
We have all seen the fruits of those Christians who do not keep their Christian faith to themselves, who vote their faith, who live their faith in a way that is forced, that is focused on controlling their neighbor. Christians who across our country and across our political history have sought to use their faith to leverage control and retain power over narratives and over people. When I was working in politics in Nashville, when I was encountering both radical activists and those who hoped to do change through City Hall, this directive would be presented to me. You cannot destroy the master's house with the master's tools. How is it that you can hope to defeat this towering structure of domination and empire using electoral politics? Truth be told, it's a contradiction. And I think some of what we saw this week in an interview with Dana Bash from our vice president and presidential nominee points to how slowly change can come within those systems. In an interview, Vice President Kamala Harris articulated a status quo approach to the situation in Israel and Palestine. Continued policies of appeasement and armament towards the state of Israel while hand-wringing about the innocent loss of life in Palestine, which of course raises the question of those uninnocent losses of lives. I share what I hope with many of you is a disappointment. Not a disappointment that causes me to lose hope or a disappointment that might cause me to change how I vote. Sadly, we are in a first past the post system. You get two choices in most places. And yet, it's a testament to the power of these narratives and the power of capital behind them that these things are hard to change. If the master's house can be demolished, it may take more than the paradigms of our media and the paradigms of our contemporary electoral politics to make that change. In the story that we encounter today, the two stories, we seem to be meeting these same dynamics of oppression and control. But I want to invite you to look deeper at the context of these two passages. In Acts 5, Peter, that embarrassed and yet restored leader of the apostles, is just a few moments after the resurrection leading an early movement within the temple. This movement is encountering the divine left and right and proclaiming the resurrection. And they are rackling the same folks who were opposed to Jesus. The same systems of power that want to continue this Roman domination, continue this peace, are seeking to control Peter and the apostles seeking to stamp out this movement. And so they arrest them. And miraculously, incredibly, they are set free overnight by the Spirit and return to the temple. And the next morning when they go to the prison to retrieve the prisoners, to bring them to answer for their crimes, the prisoners are not there. They have already returned to the temple. And so we arrive at the scene where they say, will you stop what you are doing? And Peter, fully believing and fully embracing the challenge set before him to witness to and minister in the name of the risen Christ, answers those to whom he has been sent, not as an enemy, but as a friend. We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him as right hand as leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel, that is the people in the room, 
and forgiveness of sins. And so we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Peter is speaking out of his new frame of reference, his new context, his new paradigm about what he must do. And that does not include, or rather it includes things that are more important than obedience to the human authorities. Our second reading coming from the first letter of Peter, which I should clarify is probably not actually Peter. There are a few grammatical and syntactical things that point to this being written later than Peter's life. But written by one of his students claiming this mantle of Peter, wanting to write a comforting and pastoral word to churches in duress. This letter of Peter is written to churches in Asia Minor who are encountering cultural repression. In the first century in the Roman Empire, to be Jewish is to be strange. You are granted a compromise. You're granted an exception from laws that require sacrifices to local gods and sacrifices to the gods of the city and sacrifices to Rome. But you're considered unpatriotic for leveraging those, those compromises. There are full, our, our archaeological record is full of data that points to Jews and then later Christians being regarded as wholly strange and probably perverse. Probably having weird sexual acts and orgies and all kinds of things such as we hear up and down our history when in-groups encounter out-groups. Paul, Peter, sorry, is writing to a group that is meeting harsh opposition by their neighbors, not by the state, but by the neighbors. And he is counseling them to be good citizens, to obey the law. This is the opposite. I hope that we all hear this, this radical ten contradiction and intention, radical contradiction that is a tension between, sorry, the Peter that we meet in Acts 5 and the Peter we meet in the letter. Gone is the fiery resistance. We shall have no obedience to human authorities and replaced with be respectful, be above reproach, honor the emperor, but revere God. This Peter counsels his community to hang in there, to dig deep, to avoid acts of resistance and retaliation, but to be the best possible Roman citizens that they can be. It's a very different point of emphasis, and it speaks to a different context. Gone is the Peter who is resisting the force of authority, clamping down on the message. And instead we find a Peter who just wants everyone to hang in there and be okay. And maybe, by the goodness of their behavior, by the proclamation of their action, people may be brought to God, may be brought to this gospel. In Seattle, I wonder if we might not prefer, and I certainly feel this way myself, to both be respectful and not obedient to God, but to this contemporary discourse that tells us to keep it to ourselves. And yet with Belhar, with Belhar, with those who are living in the context of slavery and colonialism, those who are living in the context of the very same sins that shaped the Americas, there's a different answer where we fear that our invocation of obedience, our invocation of embracing suffering, if suffering be God's will, where we fear that that will be the master's tools. We find that in Belhar, those who have inherited a legacy of being enslaved, of being dispossessed, the South African history is one of colonization, land grabs, 
imported slavery just like the Americas, exactly like the Americas. And exactly like in the Americas, people who are given a colonized faith, people who are raised up in that Dutch Reformed tradition that inevitably needs to justify slavery, segregation, land grabs, develops this ideology, this theology of apartheid. The very same church then segregated itself so that those who were black and those who were colored would not worship in white churches alongside white Dutch Reformed Christians. The very same church tradition produced Belhar, produced a people and a school of theologians who not only read this tradition that was given to them as a justification for their oppression, the foundation, the theological undergirding of apartheid, and they looked at it and they flipped it on its head. And First Peter, as they cite First Peter, is not an invocation to put your head down and don't rock the boat, but instead suddenly becomes the church is called to confess and do all these things, even though authorities and human laws might forbid them and punishment and suffering be the consequence. Where Peter had originally counseled the churches in Asia Minor to be the best Roman citizens they could be, so that if they are suffering, at least they are suffering for good and witnessing to the gospel in their behavior. In Belhar, this becomes, we will suffer in the name of this gospel, which demands and proclaims our freedom, which demands and proclaims our liberation. They have reoriented obedience, not from a top-down capricious God who is controlling, but a God who brings mercy and deliverance, a God whose obedience is living with love and in community. This obedience frees them, right? If we are living in obedience to God, then what are we not in obedience to? What are we prepared to set aside? Where Peter counseled the church in Asia Minor to abide by the laws, here we find Peter being used to advance disobeying the laws. We find Peter being used to advance preaching against and proclaiming against the state as it was. Which raises the question, which then are the master's tools? If Audrey Lord is telling the truth, and I think she is, then the master's tools, which can never destroy the master's house, must not be scripture but rather the paradigms through which we read and understand and apply scripture. And if we can embrace with Belhar, with those South African Christians of the uniting Reformed Church in South Africa, a doctrine of obedience to God that is an obedience to love, an obedience to community, an embracing of difference, as Lord would tell us in that same essay, embracing of the power of difference to drive us forward rather than as something to be tolerated and overlooked. If we can embrace this obedience and if we can accept the suffering that might come from living in that obedience, then we are set free, free from the concern and from the control on our lives that that threat of suffering might bring. The embrace of suffering offered in Belhar is not, if bad things happen in your life, it must be God's will. If bad things happen in the Americas, if people are enslaved and displaced and suffer genocide, then it must be God's will. The bad things that happen in South Africa, if people are displaced and enslaved and suffer genocide, it must be God's will. The bad things that happen in Gaza, if people are displaced, placed in wage slavery and live under constant threat and genocide, 
that it must be God's will, is not the conclusion. Rather, the conclusion the suffering pointed to under Peter and in Acts is the suffering that comes when you are obedient not to Rome, not to your master in this world, whether it be a slave master or capitalism, a system that wants to reduce you to your consumption and to your security, but an obedience to a God who commands us to seek the neighbor, to embrace and not overlook that difference, and to live and move and have our being together in Jesus Christ, who acted, who reached out to us across that difference, that we might be reconciled together, that we might be freed from the consequences and from the dangers of threats to live as God's people. In such a context, obedience to God's will and embrace of suffering is a path to what the existentialists might call freedom. As God's people, as God's free people, and as God's children living in obedience, may we be so moved. God's name be praised. Amen. Christ Jesus, and when we're dying, it is in the Lord, both in our living and in our dying, with El Señor, somos del Señor. Through all our living, we our fruits must give. Good works of service are for offering. When we are giving or when receiving, somos del Señor, somos del Señor. Mid times of sorrow and in times of pain, when sensing beauty or in love's embrace, whether we suffer or sing rejoicing, somos del Señor, somos del Señor. Across this wide world we shall always find those who are crying with no peace of mind but when we help them or when we feed them somos del señor somos del señor
when we are marching or we lend our voice to Christ for justice when we make the choice to be God's witness standing with our neighbors somos del Señor somos del Señor somos del Señor somos del Señor You may be seated Friends, as we are gathered today as a local expression of that body of Christ, that community of people who are seeking to live, to follow, to belong to God, one of the ways that we do that, one of the ways that we important, one of the most important ways we participate in that is prayer. When we pray together, when we open up what's on our hearts, when we pray for God's action and presence, in our lives, in the lives of our loved ones, in the lives of our neighbor, in our world. We are participating in that work. So as a community of faith, and as folks gathered here in this room and on the Zoom, what are the prayers of concern and sorrow here today? Yeah, prayers for the people of Israel and the people of Gaza, as uh, it was found today that uh, hostages' bodies were found and that they had been killed just before uh, the rescuers arrived, and that the killing on both sides might stop. So for Gaza and Israel and a stop to the killing, I pray. We join our hearts in prayer. Other prayers. Um, prayers for my good friend, um, Carol Angel, who has just been diagnosed with ALS. Um, she was with me. She, she moved into my house where I was when, as um, soon as we found out that my daughter was missing and stayed there with me for, uh, for, I don't know, it was four months, yeah. When she even had a cat that was sick and she lived in Bremerton. And so, I mean, she is, and then she was with me all afterwards. She encouraged me to write the book. She's a writer herself. She uh, is 88, so this is, at the end of her life, and she's grateful that she's had a good life. But I, I'm not sure what to pray for other than that, um, that this will not be long, and that she won't suffer, and uh, that I know she has peace now, but that, you know, I guess whatever is best for her. For Carol, I pray. Other prayers. Um, first of all, thank you for welcoming my daughter and I in last week. And um, after she did communion last week, she I guess you said something about joy when you handed us the cups and she said, mommy, can we go back there and get more joy? <laughs> so, and she loves the singing. Um, she's making up her own songs as we sing. Um, so I, um, yeah, I'm just grateful. It's, I'm easing back into joining church. So um, yeah, just that's where we are. Um, but I wanted to ask for prayers and also invite you um, we're part of a group called Families for Ceasefire that meets in um, Green Lake twice a month. Um, families who are just really devastated by the loss of life, especially of children in Gaza. And we're um, planning um, an installation at Green Lake on September 15th, so in two weeks. 
um, with children's shoes. Um, and we've kind of just come up with the idea that we're going to create a labyrinth with them um, near the beach, uh, the main beach in, at Green Lake. Um, and it'll be up for several hours. Um, and uh, you're invited to come and, and walk it. Um, we are still coming up with kind of how we're going to do it, but idea of writing some names and ages and um, lay, laying them with the shoes. Um, and we're collecting shoes. We don't know how many we'll get. Um, the overall idea was like as many as per child that has died, but that number is uh, pretty incomprehensible. Um, so just prayers that that will be a, um, a space for us to mourn as a community. Um, there's some Palestinian mothers groups that are going to join us um, and just that the community can get what it needs from it, but also that um, others in the community can be touched um, and move to action as well. For the upcoming action uh, by Families for Ceasefire, that it would be uh, a moment for prayer and contemplation and grief and an invocation of God's action for peace in that place. I pray. In honor of Labor Day for all those that labor, for those that are um, not being paid a livable wage, for those that work in the darkness under dangerous conditions, such as factory farms, for those that are replacing roofs in unbearable heat, for those that are on their hands and knees picking strawberries or um, pears um, also in the heat, all those unrecognized people, for those that had to work during COVID and take risks that many others did not have to take, um, for those that feel unseen and um, are not being able to survive um, in a way that's safe. For all those who labor and face exploitation, I pray. From Betty on Zoom, for all those who are suffering with illness, whatever it may be. For those who are suffering with illness, I pray. Prayers for Polly, who is suffering greatly in regards to her relationship with the church. For Polly, I pray. So are you wanting to say something? It looks like you might be. It does seem like she's trying to unmute. Actually, no, I, I was listening. OK. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm glad that you're here with us. Um, other prayers? Let's continue in prayer. Good and gracious God who spins the whirling planets, who forms the mountain and the waters, earth and sky, and yet is mindful of each of us. God, you think of us. You number the hairs on our head and the cares on our hearts. And we know that our prayers rise up to you, whether we put them into words or whether they rumble around in our hearts unformed. Holy One, send your spirit to be with us. Send your peace, your mercy, your comfort to shape our lives. Send your spirit to those who do not have what they need, their daily bread, peace, shelter. 
Holy One, send your spirit to those with power who are not acting in manners that are responsible or not acting for peace and abundance. Send your spirit to this world and all those who grieve might grieve no more. And we thank you, God, that you are not, not merely a God that we meet in prayer or in scripture, but a God who takes on form like ours, who lives among us. We thank you that you are with us in so many ways, even when we don't always notice. We thank you, God, not only for this presence, not only for this solidarity, not only for this hope, but for also for moments of joy and connection and celebration that just help sustain us and give us a taste of your kingdom. Friends, what specific prayers of joy and celebration are there here in this room today? Prayer of joy and gratitude for the sign team, which has worked really hard on this most recent sign. First of all, for Todd for thinking of it and for getting it through session and, and getting the church family to embrace and support it. And for um, the artists that have taken on this, this particular sign that you can see in the upper room for Elizabeth and Polly and April, and um, for the message that we are actively here and um, seeking justice and joy and inv inviting the neighborhood to come and see. For the, the work and witness of the sign team, I give thanks to God. I have one. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts on my commute between here and home, and comedy is something that we don't value enough, and particularly improv comedy. It's full of surprises, and I listen to a couple of improv comedy podcasts <clears throat> that just lighten my life for an hour or so uh, each week. And I, I appreciate that. And I encourage, uh, I encourage improv comedy in our lives uh, for, for the joy and the levity and perhaps forgetfulness of reality for a few minutes. I give thanks to God. We join our hearts in prayer. I'm glad. Other prayers? For uh, the joy and relief that in the, in the midst of high anxiety and deep depression, there are days and weeks where the light shines and um, it's not so damn depressing mm -hmm. uh, for families that experience that and uh, deal with that kind of thing all the time I join uh, I give thanks to God Sal, I see your hand. Yes. Uh, the joy of spending yesterday with my granddaughters mm. and my daughter, and uh, we took them uh, school shopping. And we, for the first time, I could hear what uh, my oldest granddaughter is going to. She'll be 14 in September uh, this month in a few days. And uh, she's uh, really excited about uh, going to high school. And, um, 
and she told me that uh, she told us that she covered the math for uh, the credits for uh, next year and uh, probably she'll graduate from high school in two years i don't know that's her wish probably and i enjoyed them because this is the second time i see them this summer because their aunt from Dubai visited with them and they took them, took the family to the Caribbean and to Mexico and to Honduras and they had the experience of going to other countries. And uh, I told them that uh, Christ will be with you when you go and the little one She's 11, she's very excited going into middle school. And uh, we always pay attention to her when you say Serena is going to high school. And when we say because she, she gets offended when we forget about her middle school. And there was a joy spending a day with them yesterday. for time with family that we don't get to see very often and all the exciting changes coming in their lives. I give thanks to God. I'm going to uh, do a little humor here. For, uh, Back in the late 40s, my dad would take me to the boxing matches every Tuesday night. And I got to see Joe Lewis fight an exhibition. I got to see Al Hostak, who was uh, a formerly middleweight champion. And I made friends with him out at the horse race track where he was a security guard after his boxing left. Well, the whole thing was that I fancied myself as a boxer. And so uh, I went to Edmonds High School at the time and joined the boxing team. And I found out that one-armed boxers are not going to make it. <laughs> and I almost ruined my good arm because the referee kept stepping on it. So. The, the left left combo didn't work. The left, the left arm is still okay, but that's where I, I was landed on the ring floor. The referee kept stepping on it, and finally the coach said, "It's time for you to quit, Ken." <laughs> for uh, resilience and courage, and for coaches who tell you when it's time to quit, I give thanks to God. Thank you, Ken. Other prayers? If we, if we have named our prayers for the day, let's continue in prayer using the words that Christ gave to us as printed in our bulletin. Our creator in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reminder before we go to offering that today's first Sunday and loose change goes to the deacons. Give generously. <laughs> with, with that helpful and timely announcement, uh, I'm going to invite all of you into a spirit of prayer. Uh, as the plate goes by, as J. Kyle leads us in a, a musical offering of prayer, whether you're putting something into that plate or not, all of us, with our time, our talent, yes, our treasure, but our presence 
contribute to what God is doing in this place. So I want to invite you to reach out and touch it for a moment if you want to hold on to it for a beat. Uh, those of you on Zoom, if you would, uh, you can raise your hand or reach out with your hand or you can use the raise hand button. Um, and that's because all of us, as we said, all of us are contributing to what God is doing in this place and it takes all of us to make that work thrive. So, as we have been blessed with many different gifts in many different ways, may we freely return a portion to God for the work happening here. Amen. I draw all the clothes 
closer to them. From care, God sets me free. Her eyes on the sparrow, and I know she watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know she watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Their eyes on the sparrow, and I know. of service and with prayer we offer our gifts to you holy one we pray that you would take these gifts that you would bless them we pray that you would take these givers and bless us also that all of these gifts and all of these givers may be used faithfully for the building up of your kingdom may it be so amen part of sharing of our time our talents, our presence, is when we have things happening at the church, that opportunities to connect and serve, we want to make sure to tell each other about them. So I want to invite everyone to, to come on up um, and, and share the announcement. Tom. Yeah, we're um, just a couple of announcements here. We have our uh, monthly uh, breakfast uh, this coming Saturday at 8 o'clock. So uh, at Bay Cafe down at Fishman's Terminal. So we'll send out a reminder in the newsletter on that. So those that can join us, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. And just another quick reminder that uh, following up on the announcement I made last week that we are still taking donations for some of the lost items we had in that uh, robbery that was on Forest Incidents. Uh, instruments were taken and so on so if you're so inclined best thing to do is see uh, judy andrews and uh, she'll make sure that your donations go to the right place thanks now spiritual formation will have a meeting uh next saturday from 10 to 1 and we will be looking at advent planning so we have to wear mittens and hats and warm clothes because we always are looking a few months down the line so if you're interested in, walk, in uh, walking through the um, the lectionary I think I said liturgy net last week but the lectionary 
for Advent. Uh, we'll get that sent out to anyone who's interested in, and then we'll get together and talk about it and see what kind of themes we see, other than our regular Advent looking towards Christmas theme. But how can we turn that into creative worship starting um, right after Thanksgiving? So it's right around the corner. And that Every, be... Everybody's welcome, 10 to 1 here in the upper room. We'll have some child care, so and something to eat, although we might have just eaten breakfast and we won't need to eat anything more till dinner time. <laughs> to clarify, that's Saturday the 7th. So, yes. Yes, the next Saturday Saturday. that is next. Yes. This coming Saturday. We will be hosting Art Walk um, on Friday the 13th in the evening and Saturday the 14th. So if you would like to help host, um, talk to Elizabeth or me. <laughs> I just volunteered, Elizabeth. We're, we're coordinating it. <laughs> okay. Oh, I have one. Uh, choir is back this Thursday night. We begin rehearsal again. Uh, we're, we're a little up in the air on what songs are happening when. But come and join us if you feel like making some noise. No. Uh, no belief in your own talents necessary. I believe in you. I, I will add that, that choir has been a fantastic place when I was attending choir regularly to, to grow in my ability and confidence as a singer. So I, I do encourage people to take up that invitation. And uh, you might have noticed we're doubling up on Saturday this week. We're also doubling up on Thursday. So before choir, um, there's a chance, uh, not the chance, there's an opportunity to engage in a conversation. Some of you have noticed in the news bulletin, I've been running what I'm calling for now, Pastor Joe's reading list, um, an opportunity to just discuss some more scholarly, more difficult, dense readings than we, we typically do. They've been hard for me. I don't want people to think that they haven't been. Uh, and this has been a fun way to hold myself accountable for doing the work to inform my ministry with you all uh, and to share that with you. So if you've been reading the book that I've kind of made my personality for the last month, uh, you can discuss that Thursday uh, this week at Holy Mountain at five o'clock, and then you can stick around and emboldened by that conversation, come and sing with the choir. Uh -huh. uh, now emboldened by our time of announcements and all of it full of possibilities. Let's gather at the table. When we gather at this table, we do so because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. This table is more than the table of Woodland Park Presbyterian Church. This table is set by Jesus Christ for the whole world. Jesus has called us here to in turn be bread for the world. Following after the work of Christ, being this bread is not easy. Holy One, when we seek to be that bread for the world, you called us to discern your way in difficult situations, to find ways to live united with all of your church, to serve your people, to act for justice with mercy and love even in the midst of division. When we gather at this table, this table is more than the table of Woodland Park Presbyterian Church, and it is open to all who seek to love and follow Jesus. In Jesus' name, we welcome you. No matter where you have been or what you have done, no matter what your church experience may or may not be, no matter what you may fear or how you may doubt, if you seek Jesus, the living bread, then this meal is for you. Assured that we are welcome, let us sing together our thanks to God who sets this table. The Lord be with you. God be with you also. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God, our Creator. 
It is right that we give our thanks and our praise. When we gather at this table and we are in turn sent to be bread for the world, we are bound up in something so much greater than ourselves, greater than this congregation, greater than our imagination. Holy three in one whose nature is relationship, you formed the world, the mountains and the waters, the trees and the stars, and us in your image. Here at this table, here at your table, we invite your spirit to fall afresh upon us. And united with your church in every time and place, we sing together in witness and awe. Oh, oh, holy, holy, great God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your grace. Hosanna, we sing Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in your name. Praise to you, O God, for all your works. You created the world and called it good, and you made us in your image to live together in love. You made a covenant with us, and even when we turned from you, you remained always faithful, always calling us back. Remembering your boundless love revealed to us in Jesus Christ, who emptied himself for our sake. Relieve us of our fears, our prejudices, and our limited imaginations. Sharpen our ears and our hearts to listen more as you do. With this simple meal, cleanse us of the sins of the world and renew us for worship and witness that runs throughout our whole lives. To be the hands and feet of the Ancient One, whose glory rings through the whole world, and yet whose greatest glory is grace and love for all of us. Let's sing together number five. For everyone born a place at the table To live without fear and simply to be To work to speak out, to witness and worship For everyone born the right to be free And God will delight are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice. Justice and joy. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts that the bread we break and the cup we share may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all your church, that we may be one in ministry in every place. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now scripture tells us that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body for you. Take, eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, when the meal was over, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. When you drink it, remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, you are the body of Christ. Take and eat, drink in remembrance of Christ. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Stand together and sing our closing hymn. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain hold my hand while I run this race hold my hand while I run this race hold my hand while I run this race for I don't want to run this race in vain Stand by me while I run this race. Stand by me while I run this race. Stand by me while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. child while I run this race I'm your child while I run this race I'm your child while I run this race for I don't want to run this race in vain for I don't want to race in vain. As we, <laughs> as we depart from this place to run that race, right? I love that metaphor. May you go with obedience, with embrace of whatever God has set before you. I hope it's not too much suffering, but it's hard to avoid some full of freedom and knowledge that we are running this race not, not in vain, not doing for ourselves what God cannot do, but that we are running this race with God, that we are running this race with obedience, participating in what God has already done, that we are called to and living life before and with the risen Christ who meets us out in the world. And may the grace of God the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of Jesus Christ be with you all this day and every day. Amen. Amen.